In all of the sessions leading up to this one, I've talked about intrinsic valuation and relative valuation. In fact, in the very first session, I said there were three ways to do valuation, or three broad approaches. Intrinsic valuation, relative valuation, and contingent claim valuation. Now you might wonder, where does asset-based valuation fit into this? This session, I hope to talk a little bit about asset-backed valuation and why I don't view it as a different approach to valuation. What is asset-backed valuation? Rather than value a business based on its cash flows, which is intrinsic valuation, or based on what other companies trade at, which is relative valuation, you value it based on the assets on its balance sheet. You take each asset, you attach a value to it, and you add up those values. Why might you want to do it? You might be an accountant, and this might be your job. You might be trying to do a liquidation valuation, or you might be doing what's called a sum of the parts valuation, either because you're an investor or you're an acquirer interested in buying the company and breaking it up. So in these last few sessions, in fact, the extended sessions that represent this class, we've talked about intrinsic valuation and relative valuation. We're still going to talk about option valuation, but before I do that, I want to take a detour and talk about asset-based valuation. I say, what are you talking about? Let me do the contrast. In intrinsic valuation, you value a company or business based on its expected cash flows. In relative valuation, you value that same business or company based on how similar businesses are trading at. In asset-based valuation, you value the company by taking each of its assets, valuing each asset, then summing up the values of those assets. That sounds like a lot of work, right? And you think, why would I want to do that? There are three scenarios where you might want to do an asset-based valuation as opposed to an intrinsic or a relative valuation. The first is if you have to do a liquidation valuation. If you're asked to value a company for liquidation, you really have to value the individual assets and see what you can get for each of them in the marketplace. The second is if your mission is an accounting mission. Increasingly, accounting as we know it has turned towards fair value accounting. And here's what fair value accounting requires you to do. It requires you to go down a balance sheet, take each asset, and come up with an estimated fair value for the asset. So it's not just enough for you to tell me what the value of the entire company is. You need to break that value down by assets. And here's the third scenario where you might do asset-based valuation. You might want to value the company in parts, add up the parts, and come up with a sum. And if that sum exceeds the value of the company, argue that the company is cheap, or if you're an acquirer, take over the company to break it up. So liquidation valuation, accounting valuation, some of the parts valuations are all scenarios where you might be called upon to value individual assets. Now, how are you going to value those individual assets? And here's why I didn't present it as a third approach to valuation. To value those individual assets, you have to use either intrinsic valuation, take the expected cash flows from the asset, take the present value and value the asset, relative valuation, where you value the asset based on how similar assets are priced, or in exceptional cases, or if you're really lazy, you might decide to take the accounting valuation for the asset, which is book value. So that's the way most people come up with the values of the assets. And I'll be quite honest, most asset-based valuations are extremely dependent on accounting book value. Now, when you look at when it's going to be easiest to do an asset-based valuation, it's easiest to do asset-based valuation for businesses which have the following characteristics. The assets they own are separable. Separable as opposed to what? You have assets that are linked to each other. The cash flows you get are collective cash flows. It's going to be much more difficult to value the assets separately. I'll give you an example. Let's take the old Disney. The old Disney had movies and it had theme parks, right? Valuing the movie business and the theme park business separately was always difficult to do because they spilled over into each other. The movies created the characters who roamed the theme parks, and the theme parks fed back with kids who went to see the movies. That would have been a tough business to value as the sum of its parts. So the assets have to be both separable and they have to have standalone cash flows. It also helps if there is a marketplace for these assets where you can see what they typically trade at. I'll give you the easiest scenario for doing an asset-based valuation. You have a real estate holding company with five real estate properties. You could value each property separately. They're separable. They have standalone cash flows. And because real estate trades in its own marketplace, you can come up with estimated values for each of these individual assets. So let's look at liquidation valuation, accounting valuation, and some of the parts valuation to see how you might tweak asset-based valuation to best fit what you're asked to do in each approach. In liquidation valuation, you're asked to value a company in liquidation, right? Because you have to value the assets if they were sold today, I think it makes far more sense for you to do relative valuation than intrinsic valuation. You have to sell those assets in a marketplace today. It really doesn't matter what you think about expected cash flows. 
It matters what those assets will get in the marketplace today. And because you're liquidating those assets, if there's urgency involved, if you have to liquidate the company quickly, you might have to attach a liqui liquidation discount or an illiquidity discount to those assets. How much that will be will depend on the assets. So liquidation valuation is a special case of asset-based valuation. And you can see why so much liquidation valuation is often based on book values and growth potential doesn't matter. In accounting valuation, you have a split mission. And I'm afraid accountants are not quite clear what they mean when they say fair value. If you look at the accounting standards, there's a lot of talk about value through the eyes of a market participant. In fact, what accounting seems to want you to do, estimate a value that you could get if you sold your asset, whichever asset it is, to a market participant out there, a willing buyer. Which would suggest that if you're doing accounting-based fair valuation, that it should be tilted towards relative value because that's what tells you what somebody would pay for the asset today. But almost all of the accounting rules are still written in terms of intrinsic value. So a lot of accounting fair valuations often dance as intricate dance, where the accountants use in, in, intrinsic value models to value assets, but then have to justify those values as also relative values. I think accounting has to make up its mind soon. When it says fair value, does it mean intrinsic value or does it mean relative value? Because as long as it leaves it fuzzy, it's going to leave room for not just discretion, but terrible accounting scandals. Which brings me to the third and final use for asset-based valuation. This is the place where I find it most useful, as some of the parts valuation.